Well, hello there, watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see then what is making the headlines with the political editor of the Daily Mirror, Pippa Creera, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Welcome to you with us until just before midnight. So to the front pages then, let's start with the Financial Times. Leads on the UK widening the booster jabs programme to all adults in the hope of beating the Omicron coronavirus variant. The Metro front page also reports on the expansion of the booster jabs rollout. The Eye with a similar headline. Let's take a look. Uh, boosters for every adult, it says. And the Mirror leads with similar words. New variant battle as the gap between second and third doses cut to three months. Rush jab, they say. The Guardian reports that ministers want the NHS to return to distributing 500,000 vaccines a day. The Daily Telegraph has a picture of President Joe Biden as it quotes him saying there is no need for new COVID restrictions in the face of the Omicron variant as he said its emergence was not a cause for panic. And the Daily Star reports despite concerns around the new variant, under current rules, school nativity plays can still go ahead. Quoting, as you can see, a well-known TV drama. So we're joined tonight by Pippa Creera and Harry Cole. Welcome to both of you. Um, so uh, many of the newspapers leading on this. In fact, I think there was a clean sweep, was it not? And uh, the message from the government, of course, is that uh, they want the boosters to beat this, whatever, Harry, this turns out to be. <clears throat> yes, it's a sort of by, by some time, a few restrictions will come into, come into force overnight. Masks on trains, which my train was anything to go by this morning. People have... Uh, taking that into their own hands before it becomes a law at 4 a.m. tonight or where, whenever it is, and travel restrictions coming in uh, overnight while the world scrambles to work out whether this really is uh, a sort of vaccine-busting um, menace uh, of a mutant of a mutant COVID strain as, as, as some fear or whether we might be slightly overhyping this and um, the government are going to, regardless of that, use it as a massive opportunity to drive their booster campaign. Um, there was a booster announcement that was meant to be coming today anyway, before Boris Johnson's shock um, Saturday night press conference where he decided to break a habit of, a, of his premiership so far and actually go further and quicker and faster than anyone expected to uh, before he was sort of forced dragging into it like we've seen with previous um, sort of COVID moves. But, um, you know, there's an argument to be made also that the government are very comfortable on this terms. After a rocky few weeks, there's nothing more, actually, than they they love to be doing than banging the drum for boosters. And I think we'll be seeing a lot of the PM tomorrow who's um, ordered the whip to be cracked again, uh, cracked once again and uh, get, get, get jabs in arms up to sort of 500,000 a day, three and a half million a week in that way that we saw earlier in the year, um, at the sort of peak of the vaccine rollouts. I think we'll see a sort of call to arms for a national effort again tomorrow. Yes, and Pippa, do you share um, Harry's, and I don't know if I'm paraphrasing you, slight sense of scepticism here, uh, not, not to undermine the possibilities of this variant, certainly, but, you know, this is politically expedient on a number of, uh, on a number of measures. One, it, it boots out stories of second, ho second jobs and, uh, and sleaze. It, it brings in new measures, which maybe they wanted to do to protect Christmas, and that idea of really trying to get through the booster programme as quickly as possible, you know, to save the winter and save the NHS. Those are all good reasons why you might want to be rather concerned about about this variant? Well, it's certainly more of a comfort zone for the government, isn't it? They have, over the last couple of years, um, had a sort of a bumpy ride on coronavirus until they got to the point of the vaccine rollout, and that is widely regarded as the great success of the NHS and the Vaccines Task Force and so on. So um, it's not a surprise that they're, they're happy to talk about it. However, um, there was previously some concern in government about um, the amount of time it was to, it was taking, despite the fact that the booster campaign was underway to get everybody done. So, you know, if this ends up just being an opportunity to speed that up, then I don't think anybody's going to complain too much. Um, it, th that in itself, though, will present some challenges because, of course, about 50 of the mass vaccination centres, which were set up, which we saw last year, when uh, the vaccine rollout began, have been closed since the spring. And many GPs who administered um, the jabs as well have gone back to their day, the day-to-day -day, um, work with patients um, and also administering the, the flu jabs. So stepping up the campaign, putting it on steroids, as Sajid Javid um, announced to the Commons today, isn't necessarily going to be, um, you know, one click of the fingers and then it's done. And then they also, we're waiting to find out um, about who will get the jabs first, both 
the um, with Professor Jonathan Van Tam and Sajid Javid both said today that the NHS would be announcing in the coming days how that would work, the operational side of things. But the expectation is that it will sort of work its way down the age cohorts as the, much as the original boosters did. So you don't end up in a position where a bunch of healthy 18-year-olds dash along and get all the booster jabs, leaving vulnerable 48, 49-year-olds um, who or more vulnerable 48, 49 year olds who haven't had yet yet had their booster jabs. So you know, there's this bit of there's a bit still to come in terms of what we're going to learn about the booster campaign. Yes, it's definitely more comfortable territory for the government. Um, we don't, as Harry rightly says, yet know how serious Omicron is going to be. Um, we're, we're not going to know for a few weeks, and until then, I'm sure there'll be lots of speculation. So, uh, Daily Telegraph, um, as we uh, saw uh, in our papers list there, no cause for panic. President Joe Biden saying that new restrictions should not be necessary to deal with Omicron. Telegraph, never a fan of a restriction. Uh, it brings me to a question, Harry, for you, which is, is, is it difficult for readers to digest the news on um, the virus objectively? Because the papers do have their own axis to grind, don't they? I wouldn't say their axis is a grind, but I do think there is a, a sense of inevitability about this. There's lots of people sort of, our sort of post bag was a little bit full of, here we go again. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, they, the government were always very caveated in what they said about a future lockdown and a great Christmas coming. It's always dependent on this future, you know, on, on there not being a, mut a, a mutation, a, a variant of concern coming down the line. And lo and behold, here it is, three, you know, three weeks before, um, you know, people are going to be moving around the country, making their plans. So I think there's a bit of grim uh, <laughs> grim acceptance of it. Um, but the problem is, is that the science is so advanced now, we just don't know um, how bad it's going to be. In fact, you know, if you go back and listen and think about how long it took for the you know, true effects of the original virus, if, um, to, to be to be known how you know how sort of before the the alpha beta delta variants Kent Brazil whatever we called them back then um, the problem is is this is this is a relatively new um, phenomenon uh, and I don't think there has been really time for anyone to make a clear decision on it so I think there's mostly just confusion about it in the fact that the government doesn't seem to want to get caught on the hop by it but really they could well be rowing back in a few days once it becomes clear whether this is really is the, the, the variant that could could uh, could you know blow the whole vaccine rollout, I thought really interesting. Two really interesting things happened today. One, Clive Dix, um, who is the was a former chairman of the vaccine task force, popped up on the BBC and said, hey, "You know what? Actually, I'm not concerned about this at all. I don't think this will be the one. I'd be almost impossible if the, for this variant to break the vaccine." Didn't quite go with the narrative um, other people are pushing. And the second really interesting I thought, thing I thought there was a inevitability about it all is the most vulnerable people in society, the ones with the, with the weakest immune systems, are going to start getting their fourth doses. And where the most weak in society have started, the whole vaccine rollout has shown everyone else has followed. So when does this end? Do we do we have a booster campaign forever now? And uh, you know, will we will we will we will we just be talking about the next jab? You know, in in the future forever. Yeah, that you're right. The immunocompromised have had a third primary jab, which means they will be eligible for a booster jab, which of course is their fourth jab. Um, the Guardian and the Financial Times talking about the booster rollout. Uh, the Guardian a race to return to 500,000 UK jabs a day. Uh, I think the Telegraph is pointing out that about 25 million adults yet to have their boosters are now eligible. I mean, that's that's a job, isn't it, for the NHS? And the Financial Times as well, Pippa, booster jabs drive widen to all adults in the battle to quell uh, Omicron. Um, we will see. And we because there's a delay in actually reporting these cases, UK rises uh, to 11, the, the Financial Times said, we are presuming that there are many more cases in this country and across Europe, I'm guessing, Pippa. Yes, that's right. And I've spoken to um, government officials today who think that the number could be um, at least 10 times uh, uh, that meant that number. Um, we know of, I think it was six in Scotland and two more today in England, taking the English total to, to five. Um, but 11 is, is, you know, I think a, a very, very, very conservative estimate. It's, of course, only those cases which have actually been confirmed and um, a slightly worrying um, revelation from John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister in Scotland this morning when those cases were announced, which was that they, as far as they could work out, the cases did not have any recent travel history in Southern Africa, indicating that they were already 
um, they, they basically picked it up from the community and the community spread was, un, was already underway. And as we know from coronavirus throughout, you know, the original seeding of the virus in the UK and subsequent um, subsequent variants that that uh, inevitably it, it arrives a lot faster than than you know we can pick up on it and, and um, confirm it officially. That's just the way it works. So it, we know from South Africa that it's a very fast spreading variant. Um, what is not yet clear is um, how uh, how effective the vaccine will be, as we've said. Um, and the key metric which the government is using is hospitalizations, uh, as Sajid Javid told MPs today. Um, and the problem with that is that um, you know there's there's a, there's a lag between when people get the uh, get the virus in the first place and then the symptoms develop and then they might end up in hospital. Um, so, you know, we, the government said that the, they're going to be in place for, they're going to be reviewed in three weeks' time. So before Christmas, they certainly indicated before MPs disappear for the Christmas break. Will that be soon enough for them to be able to tell how dangerous this particular virus is and whether it can evade the vaccine, I'm not sure that it will. Mm. So, um, you know, they're making all, all the leaders in all the different parts of the UK are saying that it's not just about, um, that these aren't just restrictions, that they're, that they're precautions. But I think if they continue over, over Christmas, and if indeed we need more, the FT is one of the papers that suggests that they're, they're planning as contingency um, for working from home guidance over, over Christmas. Um, and that the, ex that the extension of face masks could um, apply to pubs and restaurants in England as well, because at the moment, obviously, it's, it's just public transport and, um, uh, and shops, then, you know, we could see a situation at Christmas, not in lockdown, but where there are, um, there are sort of more restrictions on, on, uh, on our lives until we have a clearer answer um, as to how dangerous Omicron actually is. Yes, indeed. We'll just whiz through the last couple of papers we were going to do. Daily Mirror, uh, your paper, Pippa, Rush Jab, the new variant battle, and the Daily Star, Jesus, Mary, Joseph and the wee donkey, uh, because, uh, as well as boosters for over-18s, uh, second jab being offered to 12 to 15-year-olds, and now the question about 5 to 12-year-olds under active consideration. But for the moment, the school nativities can go ahead if it's safe to do so in your schools. <laughs> Uh, Sir Keir Starmer, Pippa, picked a rather busy news day to have a, a, a small, rather large reshuffle. <laughs> well, I think that was—I think that was initially the point that um, there was lots else going on, um, and uh, as ever, uh, Labour in particular, with all sort of suggestions that it's more concerned about looking inwards than outwards, was quite keen just to get on with it. Um, but it ended up being a, a very broad-ranging reshuffle, apart from Angela Rayner, who's the deputy leader. Um, her future of work post and um, the shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, almost every other post, there's a couple of others too, but almost every other post um, was was changed. And um, there was some, a couple of sort of big hitters brought, uh, either promoted or brought into the shadow cabinet for the first time under Keir Starmer. Starmer. Yvette Cooper, obviously, is the big name who um, was a cabinet minister under Gordon Brown. In fact, I think her first front bench, bench job um, was as a health minister in the late 90s under Tony Blair. So she certainly has a lot of experience to offer. And she's become quite well known as a, as a, um, a Labour figure. And actually, you look at this new Labour shadow cabinet, and it quite possibly has as many recognisable names as the actual cabinet, which uh, for opposition is, is quite impressive. Oh, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, Yvette Cooper is Yvette Cooper is well known. Um, she's been, you know, around for. I'm sure she won't mind me saying this. Around for a long time on the front bench, on the front uh, line of politics, and uh, it was felt that Labour needed somebody that was uh, possibly a bit punchier and could um, okay. take Pretty Patel hold, to task. Hold that thought because I mean we've got 30 seconds left, and you should have seen Harry's face during that. I have to say, but anyway, very quickly, <laughs> very quickly, Harry. <laughs> I'm not sure they'll be. Uh, I'm not sure they'll be lining up in the streets to recognise Bridget Philipson and uh, and people like that. No, no, it is a, a definitely a new broom for Keir, um, and also an absolutely brutal drive-by shooting on Angela Rayner this morning. The day of her big speech gives her five minutes warning of the reshuffle, sends her out onto the airwaves all morning to say there's not going to be a reshuffle, and then um, utterly humiliates her. If only he was good that good at attacking the government rather than his own side, Sir Keir might be making some headway.